homosexuality is an adaptation, not an inborn trait. Wow. And she is wow. a gay activist. Wow. But she's honest. Is there any reason to rethink what the Bible has to say about homosexuality? Find out on this episode of LED Live. Hey everybody, welcome to LED Live. Today we have a really great ministry colleague, friend of ours here to join us. Ron Woolsey is part of Coming Out Ministries. Perhaps you guys have seen some of the work that we've done with his other co-founder, Michael Carducci. Um, but we've been blessed by having your ministry kind of come and teach us a few things. But today's topic I know is a hot button topic and there are a lot of questions and we are starting to see a lot of people trying to re-examine or reframe maybe what the Bible has to say on the topic of homosexuality. And so, um, Ron, thank you for coming by to bless us today. Well, thank you, it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, you know, it appears that the authority of the Word of God is under full assault today in the world. Uh, I said in the world, but unfortunately, it's also under assault in the church, mm. in the Christian church. Um, and one example, and this is what I wanted to talk about today, is a, a fairly new book that has come out. Mm. It's called Unclobber, mm. uh, Rethinking Our Misuse of the Bible, mm. Our Misuse yeah. of the Bible yeah. I think on Homosexuality. The premise right there is kind of like, you need to stop beating me over the head. Right. Exactly. Like, like you get the whole a... message right there yeah. on the cover of the book. Wow. And the, the author is Colby Martin, and he is a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. He was actually uh, let go by his own church because of his stand, and he started another uh, community-type church or non-denominational church. But um, I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. that book and uh, kind of do a review of that today. but. But first of all, I like to lay the foundation from the Word of God, the very Word of God that is, that is under attack today. In Proverbs, we see that God's Word is referred to as the way of life. Uh, reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And in 1 John 4, verse 8, we are told that God is love. And I think it's important for us to, to make this the foundation of our whole discussion, that God... Mm -hmm is love. So everything in the Word of God comes from a heart of love. Mm -hmm. And um, some things are kind of hard to relate to. I mean, his reproofs, corrections, instructions, his warnings, even his punishments come from a heart of love. And any of us who've ever had parents mm -hmm. <laughs> know that um, our loving parents sometimes reprove us mm -hmm. uh, in punishment. So that really is something we have to keep in mind at all times. And so I ask the question, if God is love, can he be homophobic? Mm. Because we're accused of, when we use the word of God, we're accused of being homophobic. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, I like the word, and I coined it, homoagopic. I think oh. God is homoagopic. I know that the years that I was in the gay culture myself, I know now, God loved me very much. Mm -hmm. He loved me even though I was gay. Now, He didn't love me the way I was, but He loved me in spite of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that He is homoagopic, and we should be too. I mean, mm -hmm. I have friends that are in the gay community, and, and, and I love them, mm -hmm. and I have a burden for their eternal life. Mm -hmm. When I left the Lord in my youth uh, many years ago, uh, I, I wanted to be free from this oppressive law that just says, thou shalt not, mm -hmm. thou shalt not. I thought of it as such a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't stop to realize that James refers to the law of God as the perfect law of liberty mm -hmm. uh, in a couple places, John, uh, James one twenty five and also James 2, 10 to 12, the law of liberty. And so as I look back on it now in my effort to be free from the law of God, mm -hmm. I was seeking to be free from liberty. Mm -hmm. And if you're free from liberty, where does that leave you? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that kind, of, that kind of leave you in bondage? Right. I didn't realize that I was leaving liberty and willfully going into bondage. Interesting. Now there's a text of scripture that, that is, this was a pivotal, a pivotal 
text of Scripture in my own conversion, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, and it lists a number of, of behaviors that will not be in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And then it says, be not deceived. And I think this mm -hmm. is very important. Those three words, be not deceived. Mm -hmm. No matter what books you read, no matter what you hear in the world, no matter what you hear in the church, mm -hmm. be not deceived. These behaviors will not be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And among those behaviors is homosexuality. Mm -hmm. But verse 11 was such, this was a pivotal verse, and such were mm -hmm. some of you. Mm -hmm. But ye are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. and by the Spirit of our God. So I look at the Word of God. I mean, to me, it is solid. It gives me hope. When mm -hmm. I was in the gay culture, it gave me hope. It gave me direction. Mm -hmm. It stomped on my toes mm -hmm. like crazy. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I was the one in error. And, mm -hmm. and um, I responded to the call of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Also in the Word of God, in Hosea 4, 4, verse 6, I think this is a very important passage of Scripture. God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Okay. And in coming out ministries, we have kind of a three-pronged approach. We want to inspire the church mm -hmm. uh, with our testimonies of deliverance from the, mm -hmm. the gay culture. We want to enlighten the church by educating with what we have learned through our study. Mm -hmm. And this program today is a part of the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. We also want to equip the church, and the Lord is using us to create resources, mm. the like of which we would really have appreciated in our youth mm -hmm. had there been such a thing in the church. Mm -hmm. But notice the next part of this verse, mm -hmm. because thou hast rejected knowledge, mm -hmm. I will also reject thee. Mm -hmm. Friends, that's a, that's a fearful warning mm -hmm. right. from God who is love. Right. Very if patient. You, yes. You know, you're destroyed for lack of knowledge, but... But if you reject knowledge that is available, that mm -hmm. I am making available in my word, mm -hmm. then I have no choice but to reject you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fearful warning. Mm -hmm. And then this is one of my favorite texts, 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. Mm -hmm. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. All scripture. And is profitable for doctrine, which means teaching, mm -hmm. for reproof, for correction, or instruction in righteousness, mm. you know, that the man of God may be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. Mm -hmm. I remember in one of my sermons one day in church, I was, I was apologizing to the congregation because I felt like I had come across too strong and was <laughs> stepping on toes. And one of my elders raised his hand and interrupted my sermon, and he would not be overlooked. And he announced to the whole church, he said, Pastor Ron, any time, I'm, any day I come to church and my feet are not stepped on, mm -hmm. my toes are not stepped on, mm -hmm. I feel cheated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought, well, praise God. That's what Scripture is for. It is to show us where we need correction. Mm -hmm. um, now, also, Peter talks about, he says, our beloved brother Paul, in all his epistles, in which are some things hard to be understood, anyone reading the epistles of Paul can agree with Peter. Mm -hmm. Some of Paul's writings... I think, it, I think it was his Ph.D. that made mm -hmm. it so difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but some things are hard to be, to, to be understood, mm -hmm. which they that are unlearned and unstable rest mm -hmm. or twist, mm -hmm. as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Mm -hmm. You know wow. what I'm hearing now, even in our own denomination, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, some of our theologians are actually saying that the writings of Moses and the writings of Paul do not apply to us today. Oh, oh wow. Look at this text right, right here. Right. And I know the writings of Paul are hard to be understood, but I would not be here today if it were not for that difficult right. writing of the Apostle Paul. It may be hard to understand, but spiritual things are spiritually discerned, yeah. right. and they can be understood. Mm -hmm. And I give Paul a lot of credit for where I am today. Mm -hmm. Uh, then in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, it talks about those that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. truth. Mm -hmm. And what is truth but mm -hmm. fact? Mm -hmm. And when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus changes not. Facts cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. Facts are facts, and truth is fact. And if we do not love truth, that means 
we love a lie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't think any of us would admit that we want to be lied to and mm-hmm. like being lied to. Mm-hmm. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Mm-hmm. You know, who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And I think this is what we're looking at when we're looking at this book called mm-hmm. Unclobber. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, one of my favorite commentators on Scripture has this to say, mm-hmm. The plainest and simplest, as well as the most difficult passages, will be wrested from their true meaning. Uh, There are those who select such portions of Scripture as best serve their purpose, Mm -hmm. interpret to suit themselves, and then present these to the people. Mm -hmm. The whole Bible should be given to the people just as it reads. And if we cannot accept the Bible just as it reads, are we not like a ship without a sail and yeah. floundering on the sea? There has to be a line of truth. Uh, if there's no line there, it's like, how do you know what's real and what's not? Are you making that up as you go along? It's like there has to be something that you're judging all that against. It's something that's reliable. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether you like it or not, at least it's solid. Yeah, that's right. And then when I look at this book, Unclobber, um, the, the author talks about why he wrote this book and why he went to all of this trouble to, um, to take a look at all of these, what he calls clobber texts of Scripture, mm-hmm. any text that deals with homosexuality. Mm-hmm. He wanted them to mean something else mm-hmm. because as a little boy, he and his friends liked to play or use a jacuzzi that belonged to this, he says, good lady that lived across the street. She was a lesbian, mm. but she was such a good person, he says. Well, I, I have to quickly say the Bible says there's none, none righteous or mm-hmm. none good but one. Mm-hmm. What I think he means was she was nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, you can be nice and still not be good. That's yeah. true. Mm-hmm. Right? That's very true. Uh, what are the motives of your being nice? Mm-hmm. A lot That's of right. good people are good for selfish reasons. Mm-hmm. And But in his young mind, this woman was so nice and he knew she was a lesbian and he was raised in, a, in the church and he couldn't understand why God would keep good people out of heaven. Mm-hmm. So he had this burden to search scripture to see if he could not interpret it in a way that would accommodate mm-hmm. this good lesbian woman that he knew as a child. Uh, so his, his methodology... Mm was this. And, you know, I have a degree in theology and I learned all about how to study the Word and the proper way to study the Word. Uh, And when you open the Word of God, you're supposed to open with a clean slate. Mm. What does God have to say to me today? Mm. What toe will get stepped on today? Mm. What reproof do I need today? What Mm -hmm. correction am I going to see today? And be willing to accept it. Mm But this author went into his study with an agenda, which I just mentioned. He was looking for loopholes and ways to justify what he wanted to believe. Mm. And then, you know, the the term for interpreting scripture is called exegesis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I coined another term called exegetical gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. this is what I saw because he's a pastor and he went he knows what exegesis is. He went through exegetical gymnastics to make the scripture fit what he wanted Mm. to believe. I mean, it was like worthy Mm. of the Olympics. I mean, Mm. when you when you read the book, Mm. he approached scripture to find out to find what he wanted. He was on a quest to make the LGBT issue acceptable to the church. Mm. That was his method. And he says right here uh, in his book. I want the LGBT person to hear you are loved just as you are Mm. by God and by me. The Bible does not condemn them. Their spot at the table is open. That's what he wanted. And so he read scripture with that already set in his mind Mm. that he was going to find that. So in essence, what he was doing, he was interpreting scripture in light of today's culture. Mm -hmm. But we are to evaluate today's culture in light of scripture it's a totally opposite approach and when you're talking to someone of that mindset there's no communication Mm -hmm. there's no way to resolve Mm -hmm. if you don't have the same 
rule of faith and practice, you cannot resolve these issues. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that this is a really good basic foundational understanding of how to approach the Bible with any topic. It's not yes. just LGBT. It's yeah. like this could be applied to anything. And that's, that's why I think this topic is really important because it allows us to say, what does the Bible really say about this? And mm -hmm. are we willing to set aside our emotions and all those things and go with thus saith the word of God? Or are we trying to bend it to basically make it okay for us to do that. Because if I, if I think about that verse that you read in Corinthians, um, um, all of a sudden it's like if you steal, if, you, if you're if you angry with your brother, you know, there's a list of things that are there that aren't just necessarily homosexual. If I do yeah. any of those things, exactly. um, I'm not going to make it into heaven. Uh, and so if I'm sitting there just bending the Bible to say, okay, well, I like to steal things, so... so I, I'm just you know, going to make it sound like that's okay for me, and I'm going to still make it into heaven. You know, it's like I think there's and a problem with that. That's exactly a point. Uh, the, the point that we're making here, because on page 25 of his book, he says in these six passages. Now he picked out six texts of scripture. There are more than six. He hmm. missed one, uh, mm -hmm. one very important one. But there are. He says in these six passages. We're dealing with cultures and languages thousands of years removed from our own. And we're looking for answers to complex questions that in many ways are unique to our time in history. And so, like you, Scotty, I ask, could that not be said of any and all scripture? What scripture is not thousands of years old? Right. What right. verse is not thousands of years old? But also what problem i mean there's homosexuality in lot's day and you know yes. I mean, there's there's this is not a modern cultural issue that only exists today well, in corinth when paul was writing that letter to corinth i i i picture him you know kind of closing his eyes he's in prison he's writing to corinth and he's seeing individual people in the church he said this will not be in heaven this will not be in heaven this he's naming the sins of the people in the church that had come out victorious because he says, and such were some of you. Mm. He's not naming every right. sin or That's every right. abomination. Yeah. He's looking at things that were in the church and homosexuality was one of those things. Mm. There's nothing new under the sun. That's right. It's just repackaged, I think, isn't it? I wonder if other cultures look at that the same way because other groups of people have their own scriptures or ancient documents and I wonder mm -hmm. if they look at those like, oh, well, those are all relevant now mm -hmm. because that's just old and we have a new culture well, today. Well, talk to someone from Islam and see what they yeah. say. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. no, I don't think they that flies. No. no, they don't change. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. the, the author also has these what I call foredrawn conclusions or false premises. He just states homosexuality is not a sin. Mm -hmm. Jesus never addressed it. Mm -hmm. But then when I, when I heard him say, read that he said Jesus never addressed it, I had to say, wait a minute. He does not know who Jesus is. Mm. The Jesus that wrote in sand and the dirt in the, in the New Testament, the sins of the people that were wanting to stone Mary, uh, he's the same Jesus that said before Abraham was, I am, mm. which is the I am of the Old Testament. Right. That same finger wrote the Ten Commandments on stone. Right. He doesn't understand that all of those uh, taboos or abominations in the Old Testament were written by Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, spoken directly. Mm -hmm. uh, he just assumes that that uh, the LGBT is a natural or a normal inclination, but then he's overlooking the fact that we all, what is normal in all of us is fallen human nature. Yeah. Right. We're mm -hmm. drawn to brokenness. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're broken. We're yeah. born fallen. So just because it's normal doesn't make it right. And, and I want to premise that also with um, there is a lot of straight, broken sexual people. Yes. Oh, so yeah. yes. this is not just a homosexual issue. No. This is a straight, broken, we're messed up sexually, period. It's a human issue. We're talking about a sin issue yep. just yeah. across the board. But it really comes to light when you look at the LGBT issue. Yep. Uh, it really exposes the whole, the whole premise here. And then he says the concept of sexual orientation is completely foreign back in the Old Testament Bible times. Wow. Well, the words sexual orientation are not in Scripture. Mm -hmm. The concept is certainly there mm -hmm. if you are reading honestly. Mm -hmm. But another conclusion is he says, uh, he says that those who are born gay 
are exempt from scriptural condemnation. So he just all of a sudden makes a statement about people being born gay. He doesn't give any documentation, any scientific foundation. He just says people that are born gay are exempt from scriptural condemnation. He says today we know that homosexuality is a sexual orientation from birth, but he doesn't mm-hmm. say why he knows that. Mm. Here, we'll talk about that. Here's the problem with where that, that accusation lies. Mm-hmm. If I'm born gay and I'm kept out of heaven, whose fault is it? Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's your fault now, God. That's right. And oh. who's the accuser? And it, it Satan is the accuser. opens yep. the door to everything else. You know, Sorry, I was born an alcoholic, therefore yeah. I'm exempt what Scripture says yeah. about. That's I right. was born a pedophilia. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know? anything like, and everything. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. completely And you mentioned sign. pedophilia, and it's true. The, the pedophile community is now coming forward saying that this is a, a, an inborn orientation. Mm-hmm. They're making the same claim. We want our rights. But the gay community gets really upset when you even talk about pedophilia in the same context of homosexuality. Mm. Mm. However, I come from that background, and I know for a fact pedophilia is very much involved in homosexuality. Mm. Um, Another false premise, he says, loving, committed, mutual, respecting gay relationships are exempt from all scripture against LGBT. So what is his authority <laughs> to That's say the these point. things? He doesn't give authority. He, these are false premises. They're foredrawn conclusions without any, any documentation. And I'm going to look at that here. So let's look at this one about born gay. Where does that whole idea even come from? Uh, well, first of all, there are two distinguished. There's lots of study on the born gay issue, the genetics Uh, But one of the most recent is from these two distinguished scholars, Lawrence uh, Meyer or Mayer. Is that your uncle? Mm. (laughs) No. Is that your uncle Lawrence? There you go. (laughs) Is it Mayer or Meyer? Meyer. Meyer. Mm -hmm. I I, I know the mayor. John Mayer ruined my my name. Okay. (laughs) Well, then there's also Paul McHugh, and they're from Johns Hopkins University. Mm. And they released a lengthy three-part report that concludes there is not sufficient evidence to prove homosexuals and transgenders are born in that condition. In other words, their conclusion, and these are very prominent scientists, Hmm. there is no gay gene. They go on to say that the understanding of sexual orientation is an innate, biologically fixed property of human beings. The idea that people are born that way is not supported by scientific evidence. So, and that's from the executive summary. So this thing, about being born gay, if it's repeated often enough, long enough, loudly enough, frequently enough, it becomes believable. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. Not only that, it's also comforting. Yeah. Because if you have this one message that's telling you, well, your only destination, if you're gay, is to go to hell, then if anyone comes with a counter to that and says, well, you were born this way, so there's, you know, God's going to exempt you Mm -hmm. from that, then it's, you're in a vulnerable position to accept that, Mm -hmm. you know. You know, it's, it's so close in, 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 in its deception to the original. You think about it. Like, what did David said? David said, I was born in iniquity. Mm-hmm. Like, he admitted, like, yes, I am born this way. I have this problem. But David didn't say, okay, because I'm born in iniquity, therefore I'm excused right. for all of my behavior. No, he went to God and said, God has a solution for my born in iniquity, mm-hmm. and God can fix it. So it's really interesting how that's come, you know, full circle, been twisted around, and it's like, well, you don't need to look for help, right? Mm-hmm. We don't Which is a very fixed. dangerous position to be in because you you don't see your need of Jesus anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, what David basically was acknowledging was, I was born in fallen human nature. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And therefore, I need a savior. Exactly. Right. E- exactly. Mm. Uh, the the uh, study goes on to say uh, the hypothesis that gender identity is innate, uh, fixed property of human beings that is independent of biological sex. Uh, yeah, I read that is not supported by scientific evidence. Mm. Now, who are these two men? Dr. Lawrence Mayer or Meyer? Meyer. Meyer. <laughs> He is an epidemiologist trained in psychiatry. He's a professor of statistics and biostatistics. And Dr. Paul R. McHugh is arguably the most important American psychiatry psychiatrist in the last half century. Wow. This is authority. Yeah. This yeah. is documentation. But this is not all. I have a whole study on this 
And that shows the studies that have been done on, for decades on the born gay issue, studying identical twins that have the same DNA. If one twin is gay, then the other one logically should be gay if it's mm -hmm. genetic. Right. It's only like 7.7% concurrence. Mm -hmm. It's very, very low. Mm. Uh, so where did it come from, the born gay idea? These two fellows, uh, Marshall Kirk uh, and Dr. Hunter Madsen, invented back in 1985. Um, one was, uh, see, Kirk was a gay psychology major, mm. and Hunter was a uh, he had his PhD in politics. Hmm. So you have psychology and politics, politics working together to create the born gay hoax. <laughs> it is a hoax. And the reason for it was uh, they wanted, they came to the point that they wanted uh, legal minority status hmm. uh, based upon the Civil Rights Act of what, 1964. And the gay activists learned that if they could make a compelling case mm -hmm. that they were born gay, they could become eligible for minority status mm. oh, wow. as a suspect class mm. under the Civil Rights Act. Well, the Civil Rights Act has um, three criteria for legal minority status. And one is they've suffered a long history of discrimination. Mm -hmm. That could be said of the gay community. Mm -hmm. Number two was they were powerless to help themselves as a community. Mm -hmm. They were a very small minority. The, the actual percentage was maybe 2% of the population. Mm. Recently, it's now grown to like 6%, and there's a reason for that, because the issue is being glorified mm -hmm. and celebrated and mm -hmm. legislated. But the third criteria was that they had to be born that way. Mm. Mm -hmm. They did not fit that criteria. Mm -hmm. And that's why they decided, we'll just say it. And if we say it, use the media, yep. use... Uh, say it enough times, yeah. say it loud yeah. enough. Loud enough, long enough, frequently enough. Use the media, use legislation, use education, then it'll be believable. And now, whenever we have a Q&A period in one of our sessions, the question always comes up inside the church. What about those who are just born gay? Mm -hmm. See, we've now drunk that Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. uh, the church is buying into that. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, this is why we have to show this. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to tell you about this activist, lesbian activist, Camille Paglia. She's very well known in media circles. And I respect her. She is a lesbian activist, but she is honest. Homosexuality is not normal, she mm. said. On the contrary, it is a challenge to the norm. Nature exists whether academics like it or not. And in nature, procreation is the single relentless rule. Mm. That is the norm. Our sexual bodies were designed for reproduction. Mm -hmm. No one is born gay. The idea is ridiculous. Homosexuality is an adaptation, not an inborn trait. Wow. And she is wow. a gay activist. Wow. Wow. But she's honest. Yeah. And it, I can respect that. You know, the term, sh the term should be, um, I was born to choose. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. Chose this way. And then there was this study in the Journal of Human Sexuality that found that sexual orientation can be changed mm. and that psychological care for individuals with unwanted same-sex attractions is generally beneficial. Mm -hmm. And research has not found any significant risk of harm. Hmm. So what is the key phrase in that? Hmm. Unwanted. That's right. Most I mean, I have met so many people, gay people, that wish they were not gay. Mm -hmm. There's hope for them. Mm -hmm. But they are being brainwashed. Once gay, always gay. Mm -hmm. If we can just help them see that's not true. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to be gay, there is a way out. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to drown, there's a lifeguard. Mm -hmm. If you do want to drown, mm -hmm. there's a lifeguard, but you don't have to accept it. You know, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Well, do you think that, um, that the unwanted attractions is because they don't want to be outcasted by society or because they genuinely don't want to like the same sex. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, with me, I was that way. I grew up with unwanted same-sex attractions. I didn't, e didn't connect the fact that I was sexually molested at the age of four and repeatedly in grade school and even in the military. I didn't connect those dots at the time. I didn't want to be gay, but I couldn't get it out of my head hmm. because I was victimized by men or older boys, and that was my introduction to sexual behavior. 
Um, but somehow I knew it was wrong, but I was programmed. I was conditioned. So yes, it was unwanted. And with that unwanted attraction, when I found there was a way out, I said, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't easy, but it's doable. Mm -hmm. But this same activist, uh, Camille Paglia, goes on to say, is the gay identity so fragile that it cannot bear the thought that some people may not wish to be gay? Mm -hmm. Sexuality is highly fluid and reversals are theoretically possible. However, habit is refractory. Once the sensory pathways have been blazed and deepened by repetition, a phenomenon obvious in the struggle with obesity, smoking, alcohol, and drug addiction. See, she recognizes it's an addiction. Right. Helping gays to learn how to function heterosexually, if they wish, is a perfectly worthy aim. Wow. You have to respect her. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah. You, because she's being honest. Yeah, she's and she's choice. choosing to live her gay life. She's comfortable with that, but she also respects the power of choice, other people's desires. And um, uh, she's not going to be dishonest with scripture or science. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can show someone that thinks that they were born gay and, and you hear these people that say, well, I, as long as, as far back as I can remember, I was sexually attracted to the same gender. Mm -hmm. That should be a red flag because mm -hmm. little children shouldn't be thinking sexually. Right. 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 Hmm. If a three-year-old right. is thinking about sex, a three-year-old has been involved in sex in one way or another, mm -hmm. exposed to it. Right. Uh, and there are many ways that they can be exposed without actually being physically touched. Right. So even then, there are people that are convinced they're just born that way. That's all they've ever felt and thought. So I love God's invitation that he makes to every, every person. You can be born again. Yeah. Right. Start over. Yeah. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3.3. 3. Everyone, everyone coming to Christ has to be born again. Yeah. We all have to give up something, don't we? Yeah. We that, all have to be changed. That's actually a really interesting connection that I've, I don't know if I've, we've ever talked about that on this show, but just the act of being born again, I mean, gets around that whole issue yeah. that's coming in. What do we yeah. do with people that are born this way? Hmm. Well, easy. They're born again. They're born again. <laughs> I mean, bam, yeah. solved. You see, we didn't choose our first parents. We didn't choose our circumstances, but we can choose to be born again. That's right. Then who is our father? Mm -hmm. Then what genetics right. do we claim? Mm -hmm. that's right. And we can become partakers of divine nature through the exceeding great and precious mm -hmm. promises of God. Then we stop blaming. Right. We stop justifying. Mm -hmm. We start living as mm -hmm. a part of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And I love it that Jesus, just a few verses later, says, well, don't be surprised he said, be born again. Mm -hmm. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you have to be born again. Mm -hmm. I think that's really neat. Well, uh, the other, another one of those four drawn conclusions about loving, committed, mutual, respecting gay relationships, exempt from all scripture against LGBT, well... There was an interesting study done by McWhorter and Madison it published in The Male Couple in 1984, a long time ago. Something interesting about them is they, the authors themselves were a homo homosexual couple. Hmm. One was a psychiatrist and the other a psychologist. I think that's a really interesting <laughs> dynamic. I'd love mm -hmm. to be a fly on the wall there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you, know, you could just see them each trying to analyze each other. I know other. what you mean when you said that. <laughs> But it says, after much searching, they were able to locate 156 male couples um, in relationships that had lasted up to 37 years. And two thirds of these people entered the relationship expecting to be loyal to one another. Mm. How many ended up being loyal to one another? Only I was going to guess that. <laughs> You're going to guess five? I was going to guess, but no, that's way worse than I was wow. going to guess. Only seven. <laughs> Wow. And what's interesting about that is none of those seven had been together more than five years. Wow. So that kind of indicates that loyalty does not really last yeah. very long. It, and I would not go so far as to say that there are no loyal gay couples, but that's not the norm yeah. mm -hmm. in that community. So this author is talking about these loving, loyal, committed gay couples like every gay Christian mm -hmm. is that way. No. Uh, they tend to redefine terms. Monogamy now is used to include gay couples that agree to have sex, uh, sexual, uh, recreational sex outside of the relationship. Mm. They still call it monogamy. Mm. That study goes on to say the single most important factor 
that keeps couples together past the 10 year mark is the lack of possessiveness they feel. Mm. In other words, to be able to have um, recreational sex outside of that. There's so much we can say about all of this, um, about gay marriage and so forth. The, uh, uh, there's Michelangelo Signorile who um, talks about redefining the institution of marriage completely. He mm. calls marriage an archaic institution. Wow. This was before the Supreme Court ruling. Their agenda was to redefine marriage, to radically uh, alter it. And this lady here, Masha Gessen, who is very well known also as a journalist, she says that the institution of marriage should not exist. We were lying about what we want uh, with gay marriage. It's not compatible with the institution of marriage, what they want. I, I suppose we live in a world that God is allowing us to choose which path we want. And sometimes, he, there's a lot of times people are going to choose a path contrary to what God designed for us, right? Mm -hmm. But he allows us that space, right? So it's interesting to me that they're like, yeah, oh, marriage is terrible and oh, it's old and it shouldn't be done. It's like you're going to slam on that, but then ask for the freedom to do whatever you want over here. And it's mm. like, why can't you just say, hey, if you're into marriage and that's what you want to do, then then great. I'm going to go over here and do my thing. Yeah. I almost wouldn't have as much as an issue of that because I think God allows us to have that freedom. But it's like when they all of a sudden slam this institution and say, oh, this is this is junk. If you said that about gay marriage, they'd be upset, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Well, the reason for it is they want all of the privileges mm -hmm. that go along with marriage, mm -hmm. the legal rights mm -hmm. and benefits. Mm -hmm. but if they destroy the institution of marriage, then everyone equally gets mm -hmm. benefits. Mm -hmm. So like hospital visitation and all mm -hmm. that type of thing, uh, um, there's so many different things that married uh, rights that marriage, married couples have that the gays didn't have. Mm -hmm. But they just want that to be free for everybody. Mm -hmm. And Masha Gessen herself mm -hmm. uh, is in a very strange, or was in a very strange relationship where she had, uh, she and her partner had children with various men, and they wanted all of them to be considered a marriage unit, mm -hmm. uh, wow. which is polygamy mm -hmm. or polyamory, actually. Uh, but God's plan spelled out very clearly in his word. And there again, we need to be very thankful for his word. It gives us the, the parameters in which we can live for health, happiness, fulfillment, and joy, and all of that. Um, and spelled out in Genesis 2 about a man leaving father and mother and cleaving unto his wife. They too shall be one flesh. Mm. And that's God's plan. That, another uh, foredrawn conclusion was God loves you just the way you are. And I hear that all the time. God loves you just the way you are. And I have to say, wait a minute. If God loves me just the way I am, why are we told be ye transformed mm -hmm. by the renewing of your mind? It's interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. I say God loves us in spite of the way we are. Yeah. He does love us unconditionally. I say unconditionally. Mm -hmm. um, but he loves us in spite of the way we are. Mm -hmm. And he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Everyone coming to Christ goes through what they what is called conversion. Mm -hmm. We go, which means change. We, mm -hmm. what is a change all about? It's about being changed into the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that means that that God loves us and wants to create us, recreate us mm -hmm. into His image. The plan of salvation, I think, is about being restored mm -hmm. to His original plan. Mm -hmm. That's why He says in Second Corinthians five seventeen, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Mm. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. Mm -hmm. There's some interesting commentary on that too uh, that I really like. It says the new birth consists in having new motives, new tastes, and new tendencies, and a genuine conversion actually changes both hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong. Mm -hmm. And there is a scientific basis for that. We don't have time to go into that, but there is a scientific basis for how the mind readjust and uh, old pathways can atrophy and die and new ones being created. Mm. So and yes, uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. So what would you say is, I guess the end result of, cause it's like, it seems like when you're gay, the church presents two options. God's either going to turn you heterosexual or you're going to be single forever. 
And I think relations relationships are so important to us. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's at the center of who we are. God himself is relational. So I guess what would you say to someone who is trying to navigate between those two options? Like what if they just feel like they're not attracted to women at all or to men at all, like the same sex at all? But then, you know, um, yeah, I guess. You know, it would be interesting to do a study in the church to find out how many people are single, period. Why do the gays get a license to hook up, but straights do not? Mm-hmm. If a man and a woman decide to have a relationship outside of marriage, that's forbidden. But it, then, too, there are many straight people, Christians, that have never found a spouse. They're not to have sexual relations outside of marriage either. Mm-hmm. So I like to put them all in the same basket. There are many reasons people are single. And uh, same-sex attractions are one. But then there are those that have just never found anyone that they find to be a right fit. Uh, And there are many ways to have intimacy in life without involving oneself in sin. Uh, And uh, heterosexuality is not, um, heterosexual marriage is not for everyone. I myself, the, the same year that I came out of the gay culture and was baptized, the same year I was married. We've been married for 29 years now. Wow. And we have uh, two children together, but we have five all together and four grandchildren. Uh, I took my homosexuality in my mind and did a mental exercise. I hung it on the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. And you know the fruit on that tree must have been delectable or Eve wouldn't have been tempted. Right, right. right. <laughs> And I say just no matter how delectable that fruit, it's on the wrong tree. Yeah. It's yeah. off limits. It's no longer an option. Yeah. I turn my back on that and I say, Lord, did you ever trust me again with family? Yeah. And I just gave him permission to work in my life in that way. Yeah. And within a year I was married and we had family. But not everyone has... Marriage is not the solution, I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. Marriage is not the solution to the gay problem. I tried that. Mm. my first time around, and it was a disaster. Mm. Um, It only added to my confusion. Mm. So Jesus is the solution. Mm. And the intimacy that we may not have in a marriage relationship, Jesus wants us to have an intimate relationship with Him. Mm. And He fills the void in our lives uh, for for whatever reason. When we lose a parent or we lose Mm. a spouse, or we haven't fi- found a spouse, Jesus can fill all the voids in our lives. Hmm. So, point. Uh, some interesting terms that this author uses, he uses the term oversaved. Hmm. And I thought, that how can you be oversaved if <sighs> I'm drowning and someone yanks me out of the yeah. sea? <laughs> you saved I me too much. <laughs> oversaved? Does that too mean I need a there, little bit of water left in my lungs or <laughs> what? And and here's the definition that he gives someone who is too religious, wow. too focused upon one's faith, and too eager to share that faith with others. Wow. Uh, and I hope everyone at this table is oversaved yeah. right. under that definition. Yeah. I think I think Paul would definitely fit this <laughs> yeah. description, wouldn't he? I mean right. he spoke to his own personal detriment many times. But you know, for a pastor to use that term about being oversaved, I think most of us should be concerned about being undersaved. (laughs) Right. And then he talks about the open, inclusive, affirming church, affirming Christians, which means really legally to ratify or accept. And his burden is to get all churches or to get the church to just affirm and ratify homosexuality into membership, into leadership, Mm. and all of that. But that's um, a real push in in the church today. He says, no matter who you are, you are a loved and accepted child of God. And may you have eyes to see that everyone around you is also a loved and fully accepted child of God. What Mm -hmm. he doesn't understand is, yes, we are loved. God loved us while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies. He died for us before we were born. But acceptance with God is conditional Mm -hmm. upon an entire surrender of the will. Because when you're accepted of God, what are you being accepted into? Mm-hmm. If you we're, we're very close to a university here, there are conditions to being accepted into that school. Mm-hmm. There are conditions to remain in that school. 
there are conditions uh, to being accepted into a job or a career mm -hmm. or a club mm -hmm. and conditions to, to uh, remain in that. And so with Jesus, when we are accepted by him, we're accepted into the school of discipleship to become like him. There are conditions to being accepted. We have to be submissive to his being Lord and Master. And you think about the meaning of those words. Yeah. How many of us really allow him to truly be Lord and Master and render him unconditional and cheerful obedience? Mm -hmm. so, so can you be gay and Christian? Good question. Oh, what a question. <laughs> I call that an oxymoron hmm. because in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, it mentions all of these people who will not be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And he says, such were some of you. Mm -hmm. So if you are a gay Christian, to me that says, I am a Christian who will not be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And how can you be a gay Christian? See, you're launching me to another sermon <laughs> <laughs> about the prefix Christian. If you're a gay Christian, what is first? Gay mm. or Christ? Right. Mm. Uh, gay. I can understand it if you remove the... Because there's a lot of emotion that I think is centered around that question. Right. Um, so if you remove yourself from that question and you actually get to a different place where you're like, am I a thiefing Christian? Right. Am I a lying Christian? Right. Am I a, all these other things? Like you're you taking my prefix Christian oh, no. sermon. Mm. <laughs> so, you're preaching. So yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't actually <laughs> have that... As, as, as you would say, that's okay. But then all of a sudden, like, we're redefining this thing right. to saying, well, just because of all the emotion and it's who we are and blah, blah, blah. Well, who we are is really liars. Hmm. But doesn't it take, because I'm, I'm sure the process of conversion is not something that happens overnight. No. So it's like, and, and I know as well, it's the practice of thieving, the hmm. practice of homosexuality, the practice of lying. You know, but it's like, what if you identify as gay? Let's just say in the beginning, you identify as gay, but you really do want to pursue Jesus. You do have a heart for Jesus or for ministry. You're still trying to balance out the two. But it's like, you know, you, you consider yourself a Christian, but you're still gay. You well, know? this is such a good question. I wish we had an hour to talk about it. Yeah. But I'll just say this. When I left the gay culture, I not only turned my back on homosexuality, smoking and drinking and drugs and all those things. Mm. I do not refer to myself as a non-practicing pothead Christian. Right. If I'm non-practicing, mm. why wear the badge? Mm -hmm. If Jesus came to save you from sin, and homosexuality is a sin issue, mm -hmm. don't go around wearing the badge of the thing he's saving you from. Mm -hmm. Wear his badge. Say, mm -hmm. I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I struggle with many things, but I'm not going to identify with Satan's plan for my life, I'm going to identify with God's plan for my life. The, the gay thing is Satan's plan. Don't give him credit. And what I also practiced was to starve the old and feed the new. Mm. And as a man thinketh in his heart, or a young lady, so is he. Mm. If you, every time you say, I'm a gay Christian, you're, that's negative reinforcement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like when you say, I'm an alcoholic and you haven't had a drink for 20 some years. Yeah. Why don't you just say, I used to be? Yeah. Can't you say, I used to be? Mm -hmm. And yes, I, I could be tempted, but uh, people have asked me, were you ever tempted after you're baptized that God just take that away? And I said, well, wait a minute. I was baptized. Satan wasn't. Mm -hmm. He's the tempter. Mm -hmm. I have no control of what he throws at me, but I do have control with how fast I throw it back. <laughs> right? <laughs> And we, have, we are equipped to be able to deal with temptation. But just realize that those same-sex attractions come from temptation. Mm -hmm. And uh, propensities are habits. Mm -hmm. And so we may have a propensity in that area because we had a habitual life in that area. But we don't need to identify with the thing we want freedom from. Mm -hmm. If we identify with it, we're never free from it. Mm -hmm. And so we identify as the new creature in Christ. That's exactly where I was going to go, is, is where you went. You know, when Jesus came, you said, um, you shall name his name Jesus because he's here to save the people from their sin. From sin, yeah. So if we get to the point where it's like, well, I want to attach myself to Jesus because he just 
he just accepts me, and that's all we're looking for is acceptance, then you can go find that a hundred places. Yeah. What you can't find is somebody who will save you from your sin and transform you. And if right. you're going to follow somebody like that, there's no point in following them if you're not all in. Right. So, exactly. Or there's no growth happening either. Yeah. Just, and then, you know, to kind of further address your point, it's like you're, you're asking like, well, what about the person that's in the process? Let God sort it out. Right. You know, mm-hmm. don't worry about the labels. Let God sort it out and, and God will figure it out. And, and God will make the change. So. Yeah, once I left the gay culture, I never identified with gay. Uh, it didn't mean I didn't have temptation, yeah. but I would not allow myself yeah. to be labeled. Uh, I don't label myself by the nature of my temptations. Why? Jesus was tempted in all points, yep. like as me, yet okay. without sin. Yep. What's his wow. label? Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't let temptation determine your orientation. Mm. Orientation is the direction you're going, mm-hmm. not the direction. Here's my book. Not the direction the winds are trying to push you. Mm-hmm. My new book is called "Navigating the Storms of mm. Contemporary Sexuality," and it's based on my solo cross-country flight as a student pilot right out here at College Dale. Oh wow! Mm. And I got caught in a storm flying from. College Dale to uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and then Huntsville to Nashville. Um, and oh my, the object lessons that come out of that. <laughs> but I didn't allow the storm to dictate my landing. Mm. I flew out of the storm. I had to reorient, recalibrate mm-hmm. with a map in one hand and eyeballs on the ground trying to figure out where I was. And I finally found things that matched. Mm-hmm. Then I recalibrated, flew to Nashville, safely landed flew back to College Dale and landed safely. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't allow temptation to determine our direction and our orientation. Orientation is the direction we choose to go and that we're going. Can we give away one of your books? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want it. No, well, if you guys want one of these books, we'll put a link in the description of where you can buy it. But um, um, if you want, I don't know how we can do a giveaway. but Yeah, we can do a giveaway. We'll just set it up on our website like the others. Okay. okay, so cool. well, let's look real quickly at the clobber text, and I'm going to do this real quickly because it's I, well, we're we're running out of time for one thing. But Genesis 19, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, is referred to a clobber text, and the author says, "I don't believe that the story is literal. Perhaps it's both myth and history." Uh-huh. Why doesn't he believe? He's basically saying, "I don't believe in the word of God." Yeah. Yeah. isn't he? Yeah, mm-hmm. he he says. Uh, it's, it, he calls the author a storyteller. Mm-hmm. A storyteller <laughs> that I think tells al- of gang rape and inhospitality. I think it's also interesting to a point that he doesn't believe this. Mm-hmm. So there's no real science or anything no. that's based on that. It's like he doesn't want to believe it. Mm. No. And when you look at the sins of Sodom that are spelled out in the Bible, and I'll just run through some of them quickly. Right. Pride, fullness of bread, uh, didn't help the poor. They were haughty. They committed abomination, fornication going after strange flesh. You know, one of the terms that is used or was very common when I was in the gay culture, someone that is tricking, which means going for a new person. Every experience needs to be a new conquest. They call it going after strange. Yeah, It's right out of Jude 7. They don't realize they're quoting the (laughs) sins of Sodom when they say, I'm going after strange. Oh, wow. It's right there. (laughs) He doesn't mention that in his clobber text, but it's in there. he calls abominations, when, when God talks about abomination, he says, well, these are just cultural taboos. Um, mm-hmm. I like abom- that you're... What's that? I like that you're clarifying that, because I think the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is always what people use mm-hmm. to, like... Um, Prove homosexuality. Right, to, ju- to be judgmental, to be hateful, to say, like, this is the worst sin ever... Um, oh, and no. God's going to destroy you. That's always what I've There's heard. There's a whole list up. of abominations. Exactly. Adultery mm. is an abomination. Right. So right. it's a lying tongue. Overeating. Time. They were yeah. overeating, literally. Not you know, one that God others. especially hates, well, pride, of course, but right. sowing discord among the brethren. Mm. That's abomination. Yeah. I think that may be in the church. But and he calls <laughs> abomination, uh, uh, abomination, is not in and of itself a sufficient reason for us in the 21st century to um, to turn against homosexuality or preach against it. And all these other abominations, idolatry and impure sacrifice, occultic practices, 
wearing that which pertains to the opposite gender, that's called abomination. Mm. You want to get into a discussion? <laughs> mm. Certain remarriages to former spouses, dishonesty, perverse behavior, here a proud look, a lying tongue, murder, right. wicked imaginations, mischief, false witness that speaks lies, he that sows discord among the brethren. So many abominations in the Bible. Justifying evil and condemning the just. Right. That's what's happening today. Right. Oh, yeah. That's in our government. It's in the media. It's in schools. It's in church. That very thing is very alive and well. And adultery. Another clobber text is Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. It says, If a man lie with mankind as with a woman, um, then... He, uh, both of them have committed an abomination. The author just dismisses that as priestly restrictions. Leviticus oh. is a book for the priests. That's oh, wow. a priestly restriction against <laughs> blurring the boundaries of Israelite identity. Oh, wow. what about, whatever that means. What is it Second Peter 2.9 or First Peter 2.9? Says that we are a royal priesthood. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There We're you go. Yeah. That's right. There you go. But he doesn't. That's a very good point. I'm going <laughs> to have to really add that point. into my presentation. Feel free. You heard it <laughs> here first. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's right. I'll have to add that in. Romans wow. one is another clobber text that talks yeah. about the lusts of their own hearts, vile affections, even their women, and the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men, and so forth. New Testament. Uh, yes, this is the New Testament. And he says this is a passage intended to expose Jewish prejudice and reconcile the Roman church. Oh, wow. And I don't see that anywhere in there. No. He says, We do not provide a blanket condemnation of homosexuality nor give biblical grounds to condemn any and all same-sex sex acts. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, he's saying these verses do not. In other words, he's... He's saying any and all same-sex acts can be okay. Any and all. Wow. So now he's gone away from committed, loyal right. uh, relationships. Yeah. Yeah. I was saying any and all. Yeah. See, he's yeah. lost his consistency yeah. there. Yeah. So he says it was culturally shameful for that day, but not the same for the church of t and culture today. But what about the culture of the kingdom of God? So culture yeah. dictates now what is right <clears throat> yes. and wrong. That's, that's a big gray area there. So what is the rule of faith and practice? Mm. Culture or scripture? Yeah, that's right. We believe scripture. That's right. And he believes culture. So what would you say to someone who's saying, well, how can a God of love and also who supports choice would go and destroy people who are choosing to live that way? You know, and if he if he loves up, if he's a God of love, how can he just destroy people like that? Well, in Revelation, you read about the lake of fire where the wicked will be destroyed. Is it because God does not love them? No. No. They don't love him back. Mm. He, sin cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. And if we hang on to it, will be consumed with it when he reveals himself in his glory. Mm. Uh, it's not that he doesn't love us. It's that we're consumed. The wages or consequences of sin is death. In other words, when we choose to sin, we're choosing to unplug, disconnect from the source of life. And uh, it's, it's going to be the natural result um, when you hear about, read about Satan being destroyed by fire, a fire comes from within. Uh, somehow, in the presence of God, he just ignites. Yeah. Um, it's not a matter of love uh, and not loving. He loves, that's why we start out, God is love, and he's homo agopic. He's not willing that any should perish, yeah. but many will. I've always thought of it also in terms of justice, because when someone does bad in our society, we want them to have the worst punishment. But it's like when God does it, it's like, oh, well, that's a problem. But it's like naturally we yeah. all want a perfect world. Different right. standard. Exactly. So it's well, like... You think about God, he's perfectly, he's merciful and just. Mm -hmm. But justice cannot exist without mercy. True justice. And right. mercy cannot exist, exist without judgment. true justice. Yeah. Look at all of the victims... Of, of sin, the victims of crime. Uh, God would not be merciful to the victims if justice was not meted out. Mm -hmm. So he's perfectly balanced in that regard. Yeah. 
uh, the author's conclusions basically are essentially the same as his foregone conclusions, so I don't really need to go through them in great detail. He says consensual sex is beautiful and not sinful. It's a mm. gift from God. Consensual sex. What about marriage? Mm-hmm. But he just said also all. Mm-hmm. So, so now he's saying consensual. Yeah, therefore. I mean, it's, uh, and there's no, right, I mean, I mean, a couple of, you know, 13-year-olds. I mean, all is a, I mean, yeah. All is a scary, scary word. Where are the parameters? <laughs> right? No, there is right. none. And therefore, he says homosexuality and heterosexuality can be sinful. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, no. So, in other words, it's like anything goes, almost. Yeah, and love yeah. has wow. to exist And who, de- who determines that? That's the, qu- that's the thing in question, I think. You are if you're God saying, unto yourself. Yeah. If you're saying sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, then who makes that decision? Right, mm-hmm. right. If it's consensual or not. Probably. And then he says you can be a gay and Christian. Answer your question. Yes, he promotes gay Christian. Um, but if you say pedophile Christian, mm. oh, my. Can you imagine yeah. going into a church saying, you know, I, I'm a non-practicing pedophile, but I'd really like to have a leadership role in the church, and I, I really like working with children. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm a sex trafficker, yeah. that's all. I mean, Yeah, but I, I, I'm not practicing, but that's who I am. You'd be yeah. assigned some deacons real fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he says some gays are card-carrying, spirit-filled, fruit-producing flowers of Jesus. Uh, but there's no basis for that. Now this, I really want to get this in. He says, I can only imagine how it must feel for a gay person to come out of the actual closet, desperate to be seen, to be heard, to be trusted, to be accepted, and to be loved. Now, I altered that quote. I turned it around the way it should be, and this is what I came up with. I can only imagine how Jesus must feel Mm -hmm. desperate to be seen, Mm -hmm. desperate to be heard, to be trusted, to be accepted as Mm -hmm. Lord and Master and Savior from sin, and to be loved. He Mm -hmm. says, if you love me, Mm -hmm. keep my commandments. See, the focus is different. Mm -hmm. One focus is upon self. Mm -hmm. I am desperate to be seen, to be heard, to be accepted, to be loved. And Jesus says, well, wait a minute. So am I. Mm -hmm. I'm desperate. Mm -hmm. I came to save you, to give you eternal life. I am desperate to save you. I want you with me for all eternity. And Mm -hmm. I'm desperate for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what is our focus? It should be upon him. So one focus is upon feelings and emotions of oneself. Mm -hmm. The other is focus upon the feelings and emotions of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we need to put him first. The author concludes his book by saying, neither do I condemn thee. Mm. And he puts a period there. Mm. But the very next phrase he leaves out, go and sin Sin no no more. more. Mm. Mm. And I have been told that we are not to use go and sin no more. That is hate speech. Mm. So why can Jesus say, neither do I condemn thee in love, but go and sin no more because I hate you. It does not make right. sense. Yeah. It's the same sentence. Yeah. It's, it's not a, it's a removed the same conversation. Right. It's right. the same sentence. Yeah. Well. So I, I just have a, a few concluding thoughts here myself. Uh, back to that uh, commentary before. It's actually from the great book, The Great Controversy, mm. page 598. It says, The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, if any man if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. If men would but take the Bible as it reads, mm. if there were no false teachers to mislead and confuse their minds, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. Wow. So... We need to remember Proverbs. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, Mm -hmm. like this author, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And again, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We cannot look to self for answers. We must look to an authority, an authority, an unchanging authority. And then the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, mm. but his long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, not mm. any gay person, mm-hmm. no. but that all should come to repentance. Amen. And then 
I like to close with this little, um, what should I say, it's a, a, a medley mm. of text. God is love. Nothing is impossible with him. Amen. For he is mighty to save the whosoevers from whatsoever, even to the uttermost. I love mm. it. <laughs> Amen. Beautiful. Can we make a t shirt right. out of that? Yeah. <laughs> That'd actually make a really cool t shirt. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Really cool. That that would be great. I, I like to close with that. Awesome. And I know I, I went really fast through this because of time. Um, but I appreciate the time and your questions were really good. That every question that was asked brought to my mind a whole <laughs> sermon that I had. <laughs> <that question. laughs> I wrote a book called Straight Answers to the Gay Question or the LGBT Question, having been there. And it's really quite comprehensive because I dealt with questions for many years on my website. And finally I realized I'm just answering the same questions over <laughs> and over. Let's put them all together in a book. Yep. Yeah. So it's a very, very neat book, Straight Answers to the Gay Question. Well, Ron, it's been a pleasure to have you on our show. I hope that we can have you again. Yeah. And uh, wow, what a wealth of information you have been to uh, this subject. And for you guys out there, um, please, we'll put a link into um, their website in, in the description below. And um, check out some of the books that he's written. He has done a lot of work in this area. They have traveled around the world, been in many, many different countries trying to help our church understand some of these important topics. And so, uh, Ron, thank you for coming and blessing us. We will give a giveaway. Um, so uh, how do we let people know about that? The link will be in the description below. The link will be in the description below, and then you can get one of his books. But uh, check out Coming Out Ministries, great ministry. They've got a lot of content online. They made a documentary that was amazing called Journey Interrupted, and it was a beautifully well-done documentary of the stories behind some of the people that work in um, Coming Out Ministries. So, um, Ron, thank you for, for, for blessing us with today's topic. And if you guys have any comments or questions of course leave them below um, if you're new to our channel check out some of our other content and also like and subscribe if you know someone that would benefit from this type of content please share this video with them it does no good sitting on our shelves um, please we want it to go out to as many people as possible and we love you and thank you for coming by today and we hope that you'll come again thank you and we'll see you next week